Um, this sort of report, I think, it makes us think about what particular things today, if you think about relating it to today. I'm sure there's two things that at least that come up really fast, and I just want to hear what people think about that real quick. When you think about the responsibility of what having a mass media medium is, when you think about you say something and within that second, everyone in the world can read it. That's not something that we have a long history of being able to do, but we can do it now. And so when I said to remember the government part, that was really important, mainly because I'm not gonna eventually get to Bayard Rustin, but I just want you to understand first that the government does play a role in what we see in our media. So there's a lot of distrust with our news media right now, and it makes me really upset because it's kind of by design for us to not trust it. So we have to know what to trust and what not to trust. But imagine it's like the 1960s, and we don't have as much of the internet and stuff like that. Um, one of the things that the video doesn't mention is the Kerner's report, which took place uh, a f like 10 years later. This was actually to look at civil unrest and violence and stuff like that. So we're having all these race riots and things like that. And this is about seven years after the civil rights movement. So um, that's kind of important, <laughs> I think. And um, media influences us. That's a main point to take away from that. Not something that we can just kind of take or leave. We can choose to not watch the news. We can choose to not watch a certain publication. It does not matter. I think you guys said you were going to do hegemonic standards of beauty. I love any, anybody wants to pay attention to hegemonic anything because it's so subliminal. It doesn't matter if it's right in front of you. It's going to get in. So what are the ideas? that the Kerner's, Commission, or the Kerner's Commission report, which was in 1967, right, because the March on Washington was already like four years ago at this point, our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal, right? So this is 1967. We've already had a March on Washington. We've already had a lot of people starting to talk about this isn't fair because I'm doing the same thing they're doing and I don't want to like look at the difference when the only, only difference is physical, right? We're really starting to use critical thinking instead of just like accepting hegemonic ideas. So uh, Dr. Martin Luther King called the, the Gurners uh, Commission a physician's warning of approaching death with a prescription for life, which I love that quote because um, as an intersectional minority, a black person, I'm at the intersection of gay and black, but then if you wanna add socioeconomic status and you wanna add like other stuff like that, that's like a lot of different kinds of discrimination that I meet at the intersection of. So it's a unique, unique way to look at being discriminated against. At this time, these people are dealing with stuff we just don't deal with today. Like we can get upset about the stuff we deal with, but they had it a lot harder. Um, and so when he says this is for life, he's, he's, and, and this is a physician's warning and everything, this is to me what racism is like. It's invisible, it's difficult to fix because we don't talk about it as an emotional issue, which is what race is, it's an emotional issue. Who's this? Dr. King. Thank you, everyone knows who Dr. King is because our media has been responsible to make sure that you knew who he was. But our media doesn't tell you that these people, first of all, this is not do justice for what the march was. I hope you guys have seen other images. I just wanted to highlight Dr. King. But this goes like way back, there's a lot of people. And a lot of famous artists came to sing there. But it was a gay man, a gay black man named Bayard Rustin who organized this whole thing, who made all the phone calls to all the buses. Okay, you're gonna be in charge of flyers. You're going to be in charge of buses. You're going to be in charge of the phones. You're going to be in charge of being here at night after 8 o'clock. He was the person who did that. He was the person who was dealing with A. Philip Randolph, who was kind of like a um, mentor for Bayard Rustin, but um, who was closer to the president, Lyndon B. Johnson at the time. And Lyndon B. Johnson was a white guy. He's just on the fence. He's like, you know, I really feel for what you guys are trying to do. But he was the perfect example of like that, oh, I have a political obligation to not actually do the right thing, you know, so I'm gonna teeter in the middle. Well, um, Baird Rustin was like, you know, fuck that. Like, we're gonna march if you don't give us equal pay. Um, we can't have you paying us less because of our skin color, right? 
And this is a gay man who at this time is it's not really popular to be out. So he was working with Dr. King, but at this time Dr. King's like 25. Baird Rustin was like in his 40s already. Baird Rustin had already at this time gotten back from India where he learned from Gandhi who invited him but was assassinated unfortunately before Baird Rustin was able to arrive in India. But he got to India and learned the teachings of Gandhi, nonviolent resistance, which was literally it. Like that was, civil rights wasn't really working because Baird, Martin Luther King did everything he could and he was the face of it because white people saw him as this like ideal Negro, like, you know, citizen or whatever, but, uh, and he was a, you know, a minister, so black people were able to get rallied behind him. He's just, he's got the stage presence. But that's all political. He was actually very young. He didn't understand nonviolent resistance. He understood convening authority. He understood leadership. He understood the principles and all of the human part. But there are things that you need to do to make it successful because everyone's afraid of that image, a black man especially a smart one who has convening authority over all the other black people, oh shit, right? <laughs> the government literally put resources into shutting this man down. So we needed Babe Rustin to go out there and be other, right? And to figure out another way to do it. So he comes back from India and he's like, dude, why do you have guns? They're already afraid of your skin. You can't have guards following you around. But Martin Luther King's like, um, let's see how you react when people are calling your house at night and threatening like your daughter and your wife and you're not there because you're helping people like stand up for rights in another state. Like you need to have guns, right? So Bayard Rustin came with a philosophy and taught him, dude, you gotta not have the guns. You have to show them that we're not gonna be violent. And once we do that, then they're gonna listen. And once they listen, then we can have stuff happen. So the stuff happen, this is the biggest stuff like that happened, like this is like one of them. Bayard Rustin went on to become a civil rights activist for not only our um, March on Washington where Martin Luther King gave his famous I have a dream speech, woo -hoo! He also went on to do the gay civil rights movement later, which is a whole nother one, which is important to me equally, but I don't have that much time today. So I just feel like, He's not somebody who I feel like it's important to not think about when we're celebrating Martin Luther King because it's kind of 50-50, you know what I mean? Like, these people, this was a 44-year-old who was seasoned since he was about 10 years younger than Martin Luther King was when he did that speech. Like, you know what I mean? He's 44 years older, or sorry, he's 40 years old and Martin Luther King's 25. Very, very, oh my God, all the arrests, I can't even go into it, all the arrests. Like, this guy was in the chain game for trying to get, make sure that our military, he's responsible for our military not discriminating about race. The barracks for the soldiers would have to be the, the white men, woohoo, and then they literally called it Negro Heaven, which was a little patio. He ended that. And so now our soldiers can go to the same place, barracks, we can literally be, you know, desegregation of schools happened, all that stuff. We can be in the same class doing this right now. So I just want to give you a little bit of other people talking about him so you don't just hear me talking.